It's not all about the dog, but it is too. The dog is definitely the muse here. My first dog, Man Ray, I could almost like sing a song to it. It's like the ballad of Man Ray. My first wife, Gail, wanted a dog when we moved to California from Wisconsin, where I had been teaching. I promised her a dog. She wanted a short-haired dog, like a Dalmatian or something, or German short hair. Saw an ad in the paper, Weimaraners, $35. The night before, a friend of mine's wife had said, Weimaraners are good dogs. We've been talking about short-haired dogs. And so I still didn't really want a dog, but a deal was a deal. So I flipped a coin. Five times it came up tails, so I brought home this little six-week-old dog who now I know you're supposed to leave the dog there for eight weeks so it can nurse, otherwise it'll never believe it's a dog. So I had a dog with me that really did not think of itself as a dog. And he just went everywhere with me, including my studio. And if I was setting something up to photograph, it was really almost impossible to keep him out. But as soon as I aimed the camera at him, he was just transfixed and really happy. So. I pursued that very, very delicately. I didn't want to be a dog artist. I don't mind now, but I didn't then. So I think the pieces are really good that I made then because it's very careful to make them not too cute or not cute, but just really good, whatever that means. One of the reasons why I got a dog is because I didn't like attention and I knew that the dog would take attention away from me and that was a great relief. I loved going to art openings and everyone would go look at the dog and not speak directly to me, so I'm, I'm totally into the W.C. Fields thing. Man Ray was a really powerful and noble dog. He was my first, other than the house pets that I grew up with, and I've always been a dog person and always had a wonderful relationships with my own dogs or other people's, but I'm not one of these crazed dog people, so I do have this, this kind of reserve, and I also have a kind of caution about using the dogs in my work that I abandoned recently, but was very worried about in the 70s, and I think it gave my work a sort of quality, hopefully, that uh, lasts because I wasn't just, you know, making a a bunch of dog pictures. The big moment from moving into color was reluctantly and very hesitantly uh, accepting an invitation from Polaroid Corporation to experiment with their 20 by 24 camera, which was in uh, Cambridge, Mass. Some engineers had invented this camera to take, uh, their, their idea was to take actual size portraits. That was why it was, uh, was made. But I didn't work with color. So I said no, and I didn't work bigger than 11 by 14 because I wanted my work to be associated with books and magazines, not museum walls. This seemed too powerful, too competitive with the wall. So I said no for a whole year, and then just to stop them from calling me again, I went. And very sheepishly, I brought in a, I knew it was color, I brought in a bottle of Revlon nail polish, which I painted my dog Man Ray's toenail with and stuck the bottle in the picture and that seemed like it was about color rather than being in color. And that just opened up the whole nightmare for me and my whole manifesto was shattered and I had to kind of uh, enjoy life again, which I did. It was really a lot of fun to go there periodically and, and explore using this camera. I think the dogs are not in color almost, but of course there's no such thing as not in color. They're gray or they reflect color. They're against a, a blue sky, they look purple. In the woods, they look like a ghost because they just reflect all of those colors. If it's a studio with a red background, someone might think, oh, you work with a Vigela. It's a red, reddish dog. So they're, they're kind of mirrors that way. So they, they're very sensitive to color and light there. And their eyes are, are uh, when they're young, they're, they're like a, a brilliant, ultramarine blue, they transition over to aqua blue, and then they become yellow. Some dogs that I've had have retained a kind of a blue cast to them. But uh, so that's the color that I, that kind of triggers for me. With the current thing, I've been really interested in those oranges and yellows and reds and greens, the sort of uh, almost like M&M colors that uh, this furniture has delivered for me. So that's new. I haven't worked with objects that colorful before. 
And I've always noticed in my work, both in video and photography, that advanced technology brought almost different problems. In my ver first video, which is black and white and very hazy, I sort of developed out of this milk uh, my work. The fact that you couldn't see exactly what was happening was something that I kind of reveled in. For that reason, I didn't like the Portapax, which had a higher, more, more uh, crisp quality to it, and I found it very disturbing to work that way. I also always work, I don't work this way with a camera, I work that way. So I'm looking at a monitor usually now, or if it's the Polaroid, I'm taking it, then pinning it up and looking at it. I don't go like that, and that's a very different and very important distinction for me, because uh, when I'm making videos like this, I don't get hypnotized, and I don't present to the viewer what, what I want. I, I just get lost in, in my own sort of head. And of course, color with light is very different than color with uh, paint. I'm also a painter, so if you mix paints, it's so different from mixing light and photographic uh, inks that are in, in the process the way I'm printing now is so different from the color that was with the Polaroids that I worked with in the 70s and 80s up until 2007. And w I was really interested in how bad certain colors was with Polaroids, especially greens, because they didn't design that camera for nature photographs. They, they, re they designed it for white people's birthday parties or something like that. That's, that was what Polaroid was after, great reds and flesh tones if you were uh, white and had birthday parties, you were there. Digital has changed my life in that I'm not doing things where you might assume, oh, of course, it's Photoshop. Like if I have a dog that's up on a pedestal and it's dressed as a person, let's say, with the Polaroid or the other formats, you can see, oh, there's a little bit of the person hiding there. Uh, now you have the choice of, with, with uh, Photoshop, let's get rid of that hand there or this or that. And that I like the fact that the dogs are really cooperating to build this picture, this sort of a theatrical event. Duck, hide, I can see your arm. You, you know, that's, that's the usual way I, I would direct people as I'm working. With Photoshop, you go, oh, we'll take it out later. You know, it's a whole different thing. And so now I'm trying to figure out how best to incorporate the dogs with these formats. People that have uh, trained dogs that have watched me work say that I work very differently than most people. I don't speak to them, I use my hands. So I'm going like this or like that or like that. And it's a very tactile way of directing them. Uh, each set of dogs presents a different kind of, uh, of issue. My first dogs were, were, were really into retrieving. So if I held up a ball, they would go for it. If I tossed it, they would look that way. And this new group doesn't. And the group right before really didn't. If I tossed them a ball, they'd go like that, you know, or the other group would catch it. So uh, some dogs that I've had were really, really interested in cats. And if I said the word cat, they would look for it. But if I said it three times, then they would go, oh, it's just Bill saying cat. So you have to keep reinventing the language. That's why the touch always works, you know, holding the head over there, or dropping it down. Or, so it's more like being a sculptor than a dog trainer. Most dogs really like being photographed. Once they realize you're not at the vet, you're not gonna give them a shot, you're just gonna hit them with some light. Some dogs love the, that light, you know, and they, they like knowing also being the center, being elevated, which I bring them higher than they normally are. You know, a dog's always jumping at, up at you. Well, if you put them up, they're already where they wanna be. It's another one of my little secrets. It does have a kind of uh, uh, a modernist look to it as well, I think. Uh, and I'm always reinventing art forms, it seems like. Oh, this looks like Solowit with a dog on top, or this looks like uh, you know, Mondrian, or this looks like, oh, this messy thing looks like Jackson Pollock, whatever. So having an art background makes me kind of connect up with history somewhat. So I, I was reinventing cubism and you know, in my earlier work, I might have reinvented surrealism and, before, you know, or whatever. So I'm always sort of dropping down on something like that. 
in contrast, I hated art references when I first started to make my, my work in, in uh, photo and video. I, I hated that so much. So I kept everything out and I wanted every reference to be really mundane. Not sex, not violence, not art. Just everyday things. Bob and Ray. Those were my uh, sources. In the 50s is where I kind of emerged as the person. I was born in the 40s. But by the 50s, I was, uh, you know, watching TV, which had just come out, and uh, living a kind of, uh, from a kind of Ozzy and Harriet sort of background. And I found that really the material that I wanted to pull from, that really ordinary, to be ordinary life, which is really quite extraordinary when the further you get away from Ozzy and Harriet, or really start studying things like that. The contrast between the static colored chairs, let's say, and the way the dog is kind of resting against something and how subtly the reaction is. And of course, that's part of editing too. I'll take a, a gazillion pictures and this one seems to say something. You know, photography can make you into a, a genius where if you're a painter, you have to really be a genius. But uh, I've been a, a genius on like maybe three occasions in the 50 years of photography where, wow, you know, but you know, it never happens in painting like, wow. So that's the factor that's, uh, that's pretty amusing about photography. But of course, if you don't put the time in and bring the, the elements together, you won't have anything. That's why I almost never bother sketching or thinking. I just bring the things together and think on the job. Pretty much improvise on the spot to get my ideas. But I, I used to. I used to make little drawings and then I would go to the studio and set it up with the early black and white. They're always almost like little line drawings of what I want to happen. I th don't think of them as being funny at all, the dogs. I think of them as being very serious and uh, I never laugh when I work with them. I know some people when they dress up their dog for Christmas or whatever and photograph them, it's just a laugh riot. Uh, but I never laugh when I'm working. I never even laugh when I see those pictures. I might laugh later, and in the videos, some of the videos are pretty funny. You know, my first art dealer, uh, Ileana Sonnebin, if you could hear her Hungarian accent say, almost threateningly, some of your work is funny and some of your work is not so funny. I think that's really the case with me. I love photography that goes out into the world and I think it's, it's probably the best place for it and, and what I did probably isn't the best place for it but I did it so and I'm fine with that and uh, but I'm not just a photographer either so but I think photography that like Friedlander and people like that are, are doing and did is amazing and when I was a young photographer I had to kind of be strict about not thinking about that because I didn't want to be confused with that.